Good afternoon. I think the sound system is now back to normal. Uh, thank you all for coming. My name is uh, Martin Kaur. I'm the executive director of the South Centre. On behalf of uh, the centre, now partner, Knowledge Ecology International, we welcome you to this uh, short event. Short, but uh, we hope uh, powerful because we are here to celebrate and to review uh, the Trips and Public Health Ministerial Declaration that had been endorsed by the WTO ministers almost exactly 10 years ago. I'm not very sure of the exact date. I think it's exactly. 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 All right. Exactly. <laughs> And of course, we are very happy to have this event in Waipo. And appropriately enough, during the meeting of the uh, development group of Waipo, which uh, all of you uh, who are participating in that know that uh, the aim there is to try to mainstream development concerns in the intellectual property regime and system uh, and the structure of Waipo. So what better way to celebrate this 10th anniversary, I hope celebrate is the right word, uh, that depends on what our panelists and on you yourselves are going to tell us uh, this afternoon. But certainly to mark this uh, historic declaration of uh, Doha in relation to trips and public health. We have a very good uh, panel of distinguished uh, speakers who will kick off the discussion. Professor Carlos Correa, who is a special advisor to the South Centre and very well known to all of you uh, in the community of intellectual property development and trade. Jamie Love, the director of KEI, who has uh, <coughs> played a very important role on stimulating and making uh, the world public understand the nature of intellectual property and public concerns. Uh, Jose Estenos do Amara from the Brazil mission. Uh, Brazil, as you know, was a very key player in getting the trips and public health declaration uh, endorsed in Doha and since then has been continuing to be uh, a leader in the area of championing uh, public health in the intellectual property system in the last 10 years. So we are very happy to have you here to in a way represent uh, the governments of developing countries and indeed the, the governments of, of all the countries who sign uh, this declaration. Michelle Charles, who is in Medicines on Frontier, is the, she's the Policy and Advocacy Director. As you know, MSF was one of the key uh, social movements and NGOs that pioneered uh, the whole issue of uh, access to medicines. Uh, we don't have the real heroes uh, here in Geneva today, at least on this panel, that is the social movements, the people who themselves are suffering from HIV AIDS who actually pioneered on the ground uh, this issue which for them is literally life and death and then we have agencies like MSF, KEI, uh, Oxfam and the Third World Network who were giving support to this movement which eventually led to uh, the positive and wonderful response uh, from the governments. And uh, finally we have uh, Sanya Reed Smith, she's the legal of officer of the Third World Network, another of the NGOs who were very active in uh, supporting uh, the declaration before, during, and after it was signed. So we hope to uh, hear from our panelists what they think of uh, the declaration in retrospect, 10 years later, what they think uh, uh, was a success in its implementation and the shortcomings and what we can do in the future to make the goals of this declaration uh, really ring through, not so much legally but on the ground, uh, 
uh, in developing countries particularly, but not only in developing countries, in all countries. So with that as an introduction, may I uh, uh, welcome uh, Carlos Correa to give us his presentation, and I think he has a, a slideshow for us. Carlos. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for the presentation. Um, I'm very glad, very pleased to uh, be here with you, with so many friends and colleagues. And some some of, uh, of the participants have actually been involved quite heavily in the uh, history of the Roja Declaration and also in, uh, in the implementation of the Declaration at the national level and international level. I will address, since we have a limited time, I will address uh, some aspects of the impact of the Doha Declaration at the national level. In particular, I will explore the extent to which the uh, flexibilities that the Doha Declaration indicated. Uh, as you know, one of the main uh, achievements in the Declaration was the confirmation that uh, all members of WTO have the right to uh, use the flexibilities contained in the Chips Agreement. The question is, however, to what extent these flexibilities have been used in developing countries, and if there isn't an ex an, an, a very significant use, what the reasons are for such limitations. So if we look at the uh, legislation in developing countries today in respect of some of the main uh, um, flexibilities that are allowed under the CHIPS agreement, we get a mixed picture. Um, in some cases, we find that uh, some flexibility, for instance, compulsory licensing is provided for in most laws in, in developing countries as well in developed countries. However, the extent of use, actual use of compulsory license has been quite limited. As we know, only a small number of developing countries have so far implemented uh, compulsory license. The last one has been Ecuador. In terms of uh, other flexibilities, such as the Boller exception, which is of, uh, of particular importance in the area of pharmaceuticals, it's quite astonishing to find that a, a small number of developing countries have explicit provision of border, of, of border exception type in the legislation. Uh, according to one uh, study, um, it's a very small number. It's less than 20 countries that have explicit border provision. It might, be, it might be considered that under experimentation exception clauses, you may also claim a kind of border exception, but it is quite interesting to know that uh, there is no explicit reference to uh, this important flexibility. Um, in, in connection to exhaustion of rights, a um, significant number of developing countries still have uh, national or regional exhaustion of rights. That means that uh, parallel importations are admitted to a, to a limited, man, uh, limited way, or in the case of national exhaustion, they are not admitted at all. We also find that in a number of countries, a number of developing countries, second um, indication patterns are allowed. That means uh, when a novel use is found for a non-medicine, uh, uh, still a new patent is granted. This is not uh, actually required under the TRIPS agreement. One flexibility clear is not to grant patents in these cases because there is no novelty. However, many developing countries do allow for these uh, kind of claims. And finally, if we look at one of uh, very important issues, that this is the protection of uh, test data, we will find that at least uh, 40 developing countries do uh, grant the so-called data exclusivity. That means provides an exclusive use or exclusive right regarding test data, which again is not a requirement under the TRIPS agreement. So overall, what we can see is that uh, despite that uh, these flexibilities have been uh, implemented in, uh, in the national laws of many countries, the, uh, the, the landscape is not perhaps as, uh, as we would like to see. In many cases, uh, these flexibilities have not uh, been incorporated, and if incorporated, they have not been used. So what could be the reasons for this situation? Why developing countries knowing in particular on the basis of the DOCA declaration, that they can implement and use these flexibilities, why they are not doing so. But there may be a number of reasons that explain this. I think the first one is probably the fact that many developing countries amended the patent laws and other pieces of intellectual property legislation before 
the um, adoption of the um, Doha Declaration. And as you recall, the general um, date for um, implementation of the TRIPS agreement was January 2000. And this meant that many developing countries, such as Argentina, Brazil, the Andean Community countries, and many others, actually amended the laws before the Doha Declaration was adopted. And many of them did not use uh, to the full the flexibilities that the CHIPS agreement uh, provides for. After, after a pattern <coughs> law or, or, or legislation in intellectual property is adopted for many countries, it's been very difficult to amend them. Even, even if there was such po legal possibility, and uh, clearly ratified by the Doha Declaration, many countries have been afraid of uh, new pressures, of uh, turmoil regarding uh, possible amendments to the law. And, and in fact, only a few developing countries have amended, for instance, the patent law in the direction of incorporating more flexibilities regarding public health. And uh, certainly we need to mention uh, within this group the case of India, in particular with the amendment of 2005, which incorporated the well-known section 3D. The case of Philippines that followed the same, a similar approach. Also the case of China that in 2010 amended the patent law and included some flexibilities absent previously in the legislation. So that's perhaps one, one reason, the fact that uh, many laws were amended before the Doha Declaration was adopted. The second reason, which is, I think, uh, quite well known and, and, and discussed uh, quite often, is the kind of technical assistance that uh, developing countries received in the process of adopting legislation in the area of intellectual property. And perhaps the lack of sufficient information given to developing countries regarding the range of options they have in order to use such flexibilities. WIPO has uh, clearly been one of the main providers of uh, technical assistance. Uh, probably you already know this uh, report which has just, just been issued by uh, uh, TIR and ROCA. This is an external review of WIPO technical assistance in the area of cooperation for development. It will be discussed uh, very soon. And one of the findings of this, uh, of this report is that um, when discussing international treaties, the orientation of plans by WIPO was toward promoting accession to international treaties administered by WIPO. They also found that while the importance of flexibilities was noted, practical and proactive advice on how to use such opportunities was limited. Well, this is what we suspected. We suspected that uh, in technical assistance, WIPO was not opening necessarily all the possibilities to developing countries, or there were not, there were, there were not indicated the advantages of having one or other of these flexibilities incorporated. In addition to this, as we know, there are other agencies which provide regularly technical advice to uh, developing countries, such as the US PTO, US Patent Trainer Office, such as the European Patent Office, and, and certainly the, uh, what, what we know about the, ty the type of advice which is given does not clearly include a broad use of flexibilities. In particular, I would say, in relation to the one, perhaps one of the most important flexibilities in the TRIPS agreement in the area of patent law. And this is the flexibility to define the patentability requirements in a way that will prevent the grant of patents for minor or trivial developments. Uh, perhaps the advice given by the USPTO and probably also by the European Patent Office has promoted in developing countries, the use of lax requirements in order to grant patents, which has led in many developing countries to a huge proliferation of pharmaceutical patents without any inventive step, without any real value. Uh, however, these patents, once granted, are presumed to be valid, and they may be a clear barrier for access to medicines, uh, to generic medicines, um, even when the active ingredient may be already in the public domain. A third factor, which is well known, that uh, has prevented developing countries from using flexibilities in the CHIPS agreement, despite Doha, the Doha Declaration confirmation, 
was this uh, the number of free trade agreements and other bilateral <coughs> agreements that were promoted by developed countries with very specific and detailed chapters on intellectual property. So this is a very well-known subject. Uh, there is no need to, uh, to um, go in depth into this. Uh, as you know, uh, these free trade agreements typically required the partner countries to uh, um, get uh, obligations in terms, for instance, of extension of a patent term. In the case of the US uh, FTAs, the so-called patent linkage requirements, that means that there is a linkage between drug registration and the situation of a patent for particular products. All these agreements have uh, required the, the, uh, the granting of exclusive rights for test data, and in all of them we find a large number of uh, provisions that enhance uh, enforcement. Um, interestingly, however, in many of these free trade agreements, we can find references to the DOCA declaration. So this is something which is, looks uh, somehow contradictory, paradoxical, um, schizophrenic, you could say, in some cases. Uh, for instance, you find that Chile, when Chile negotiated the free trade agreement with the United States, Chile was able to get recognition of the DOCA declaration in the preamble recognizing the principles set out in the Declaration on, on the Chips Agreement and Public Health, so on and so forth. It is in the preamble of the FTA between Chile and the United States. In, in uh, other FTAs that the United States signed after Chile, this reference was omitted. And the United States government has apparently uh, become a little allergic to references to the Doha Declaration. Um, in any case, the question is the extent to which such a reference has any real implication for the, um, for the FTA as such. Um, we, we can see other examples where the DOCA declaration is mentioned, for instance, in the Cariforum EPA, uh, the European Partnership Agreement with uh, Cariforum, you find also in Article 9.2 a reference to the uh, DOCA uh, declaration. Perhaps in this case, the impact has been more important than the case of Chile or other agreements, because as you know, in the case of the Cariforum, there are no substantive provisions regarding to patents as, relate, as they relate to public health, although there are a number of enforcement provisions that may actually create barriers in, uh, in connection with access to medicines. Uh, this is perhaps more uh, ironical, the fact that uh, ACTA, the preamble of ACTA, which uh, epitomizes uh, the CHIPS Plus uh, paradigm also contains a reference to, uh, the, DOCA, uh, to the DOCA declaration. So we, we, we may think that references to the DOCA declaration may play a role for interpretation of the FTAs that uh, contain this uh, reference to them. In some cases, the, there is a phrase um, in the European in the European agreements. It's common to find a phrase relating to the importance of the DOCA declaration. So this may be used in some cases for interpretation of the particular provisions of the free trade agreement, to the extent that there is some ambiguity. But to the extent that the provision is clear enough, for instance, in extending the patent term, in, in creating exclusive rights for for this data the role of a reference to the declaration is not really uh, significant. Perhaps uh, one uh, impact that uh, could be different is the case of the European Union uh, featured agreement with Colombia and Peru, where in addition to the typical clause where the importance of the DOCA declaration is recognized, there is a new clause which did, did not appear in previous uh, free trade agreements, which indicates that in interpreting and implementing the rights and obligations under this title, the parties shall ensure consistency with this declaration. It's referring to the DOCA declaration. So here, the, the legal implication of this provision may be more substantial, in particular for the interpretation of an exception that uh, these agreements provide for in connection with data exclusivity, but uh, it, it may not it may not go uh, much beyond that. However, the Doha uh, Declaration may have uh, 
might have an impact perhaps in preventing the United States and the European Union from demanding from uh, countries with uh, which they establish free trade agreement some provisions, for instance, in connection with compulsory licensing. If you look at the, at the free trade agreement signed by the United States after the Doha Declaration, you will not find, um, with, uh, exception, with the exception of developed countries, FTAs, clauses restricting the use of compulsory license. However, in the case of Jordan, the agreement with Jordan, which was uh, negotiated before the Doha Declaration, there is a clear restriction regarding the grounds for the use of compulsory license. As you may recall, one of the important um, aspects of the Doha Declaration is that it clarifies that members of WTO have the right to decide the grounds for the grant of compulsory license. So it might be thought that because of this very clear statement in the Doha Declaration, United States and other developed countries were not uh, in a position to um, request uh, partner countries uh, limitations on compulsory license as they did before, in particular as shown in the case of, uh, of Jordan. Another area in which uh, perhaps the Doha Declaration has had an impact is the area of exhaustion of rights, parallel importation. Um, if you look at uh, the free trade agreements with the United States, uh, there are only a few where there is a restriction regarding parallel importation. One of one develop, in the case of one developing country, this is Morocco, also Singapore and Australia, but you don't find these kind of limitations in other free trade agreements. And again, probably the reason for this is the fact that the Doha Declaration clearly states that making a decision about the exhaustion of rights is a clear right of a WTO member. So perhaps this is what, these are two areas where the Doha Declaration has had a significant impact. Well, just to conclude, um, therefore, the, the balance perhaps is, is mixed. Uh, so Martin was asking whether there are reasons to celebrate or not. Um, that's a different question to reply. There are some reasons to celebrate, but clearly there is uh, still uh, much more to be done in terms of uh, promoting the uh, actual use of the flexibilities that are allowed in the Trade Agreement. And I think that this will become uh, more and more important as the global financial crisis may limit funding available for uh, purchasing medicines. So far, perhaps the Global Fund and other agencies have been able, to some extent, to, to satisfy the needs in terms of medicines, but this situation may become worse in the future, especially because also the demands in terms of HIV AIDS treatment have increased. So the number of people that need to be treated in accordance with the new recommendation is higher. Uh, the prices of medicines in some areas is very important. The non-communicable diseases are relevant not only for developed countries, but also for developing countries. And therefore, in this context, the actual use of uh, the flexibilities in the church agreement must become even more important than it has been in the past. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Carlos, for setting the scene. Uh, may we invite uh, Jamie now to give your presentation? Are you using PowerPoint? No, I'm not. I'll just be speaking. No, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Love, I work for Knowledge Ecology International. Uh, we're an NGO that has office in Washington, D.C. and an office in uh, Geneva, headed by uh, through Paul Subarium. And, uh, uh, <coughs> I'm going to talk briefly about the, the events that led up to the, uh, the 2001 agreement and then uh, how things have happened, you know, what's changed since then, and what we think is necessary to develop sustainable policies in terms of access to medicine. The trailer that was shown uh, before we started illustrated the degree to which the 2001 decision was influenced as, as uh, uh, Carlos
Carlos mentioned it as well, as well, and, and, and Martin mentioned uh, in, in the backdrop of a much bigger uh, public concern and social movement around access, particularly access to AIDS drugs. If you look at sort of the, the earlier version of the access to medicine movement, a lot of it was around making better use of generic drugs, resisting high-priced patented drugs, working on issues of rational use and kind of controlling prices. When the antiretroviral drugs came out, uh, AIDS was a new disease. There were no generic drugs that, that were developed for that, that worked. And when triple therapy was became on the market in 1996, it was a life or death decision. You, you did not have any generic alternatives. If you, if you had access to that triple therapy regime, you were going to get healthy, you were going to live. If you didn't have access, you were absolutely going to die. That was what it was. And so that was what was so, I think, powerful in this earlier debate was uh, the, the Doha Declaration came uh, five years after the introduction of triple therapy for the first time for AIDS patients. And it was dealing with an area that's very unequal access between people in Europe and the United States and people in developing countries. As the trainer said, uh, uh, when he said that uh, where are the drugs, the drugs where the disease is not, well, there, were, there, were, there was a disease, there was disease in Europe and the United States, but it wasn't of the magnitude that it was in Africa at the time, and that was really shocking to people. Uh, it was also influenced by the events of 9-11. Uh, of um, but just kind of give a sort of a, a quick timetable here. Um, in February of 2001, there was a CIPLA offer where the price of AIDS drugs was at that announced in an offer that uh, CIPLA offered uh, initially to, to sell to MSF uh, at one dollar a day for triple uh, for three hundred and fifty dollars a year, a price that had fallen to around two hundred and fifty years a dollars per year by the end of 2001. That was the first time when people really thought that it was actually feasible to provide antiretroviral drugs in developing countries. And um, in March and April of that year, there was the South Africa trial, which received an enormous amount of publicity. And the uh, people were seeing for the first time on television the nature of this dispute. Kofi Annan won the Nobel Prize that year by calling for the development of the, of, of, of the Global Fund. And, and, and Martin Kaur, uh, who was more plugged into the WTO than a lot of us, uh, approached uh, the Zimbabwe uh, delegate, who was the chairman of the TRIPS Council and suggested that they put on the agenda uh, for the WTO this discussion about access to medicine for all. And that's why you have the Doha Declaration, because of uh, uh, because Boniface from, um, from uh, Zimbabwe put it on there, and he started this agenda. Um, also in 2001, when 9-11 happened, the Bush administration began to look for more political support among developing countries as they were trying to regroup and figure out how to respond to the initial, uh, uh, to, to the initial attacks and, and, and what to do uh, in terms of their policy on Afghanistan and the potential invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, there was also a short but intense concern in the United States and Canada over access to the patented drug ciprofloxacin. And um, when Canada and the United States took action against Bayer's Cipro patents, the notion that developing countries should not do, the sum, not do the same seemed more vividly unacceptable to people. Uh, in 2001, the Washington Post and the New York Times also took note in the Wall Street Journal of the growing role of health and development NGOs in setting the agenda for trade policy. And as many mentioned, the, uh, the growing social movement, which involved movements on the ground all over the world, um, uh, was pressing to have greater access to medicine. And that was driving the political process. Uh, the issue of IPR2, for the first time, was becoming a more political issue. And so people at the ambassador level and above were beginning to pay attention to it. It was no longer perceived as just a technical issue that the person who knew the most about patents was the person you rely upon for the decision. She began to talk to people that knew the most about the political consequences of a life or death. They became more important voices within governments at, at the time. Uh, the 2001 declaration was extremely important because it changed how the WTO would resolve disputes involving uh, concerning the implementation of TRIPS. And I think Professor Correa has, has presented everything. Certainly, paragraph four of the declaration, which said that the agreement can and should be interpreted and implemented in a manner supportive of WTO members' right to protect public health, 
and in particular promote access to medicine for all, was an amazing statement to come, not as an NGO statement, but to come from the WTO unanimously. And it changed, as, as Professor Korea has pointed out, it changed what, what would happen if you went to a dispute in the area where there was uh, some controversy over what the trips did or did not permit in terms of flexibilities. Uh, 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 I, I think it's also, I'd like to just say that I, we thought that Robert Zellick, who was then head of USDR, and now is head of the World Bank, uh, himself was sympathetic, more sympathetic than some, some other people that have run that office uh, for this cause. And, and given the fact that the Bush administration was new, I think that he played, showed just enough flexibility in 2001 for the United States to move in the direction it did. However, right after 2001, the industry became much more influential with the Bush administration. And you begin to see this backtracking on the Doha Declaration almost immediately when the, when the important issue about how you deal with exports of drugs under a compulsory license play out in the paragraph six negotiation between 2001 and 2003, you saw almost an immediate change in both the European Union and the United States government. They took a much more hardline position. There was a big battle at that time over whether or not they could try and redefine the Doha Declaration as only limited to a certain number of diseases, the so-called scope of disease debate. There was even a Doha curse that put a curse on any delegates that uh, tried to restrict the scope of disease by hoping that their children and their children's children would suffer from the diseases that were excluded from the outcome of the negotiation. It was uh, There were uh, 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 demonstrations, th street theater, there was a lot of controversy over that at the time. The outcome was this complicated mechanism, the 2000, uh, 2003 agreement on compulsory licensing, that was controversial. Uh, it's a prob highly problematic mechanism, but despite its shortcomings, it will probably be used, in particular if it's implemented, as in the case of India, as a mandatory compulsory licensing option. Interestingly enough, the United States has found a way to resolve the export issue outside of the 30 August decision, not only for medicines, but for any technology, including, for example, for medical devices, or even for software, using the flexibility um, in the TRIPS uh, to limit the remedies on, uh, uh, on the infringement of patents through Article 44 of the TRIPS. Um, the, in this regard, I'd like to say that in the current discussions in the WTO, that India recently has raised this issue of whether or not the mechanisms which are found in Article 44 of the TRIPS is limited on the remedies. And Ecuador has raised the issue about whether the ability to uh, permit exports under competition-related issues provides better flexibility than the August 30 decision. And we think it's important that those things be looked at, uh, particularly since these issues are not limited just to medicines for which you have this particular area. There's, this sort of, there's broader development issues involving uh, climate change and other technologies as well. Um, however, uh, the more pressing issue is that in the bilateral agreements, and in agreements like ACTA and other things, there's this massive backtracking of the initial spirit of the 2001 Doha Agreement. And uh, the bigger problems are not even legal problems. They're, although the legal, thing, the legal restrictions in the FDA agreements are important, uh, the more blunt force that's used to prevent countries from using their trips flexibility is typically political pressure or other, other sort of invisible, non-transparent trade pressures, which is, as Carlos mentioned, all the cases where compulsory license have not been issued, where they are, they're, they're, they're on the books, they're within the law, they're, in, in, in theory, you're supposed to, should, you're supposed to actually use them in order to promote access to medicine for all, but it does not happen, and it does not happen primarily because of the pressure which is done in these non-transparent uh, uh, bullying tactics. Uh, in the longer run, we think that sustainable access to medicines will depend upon the success of building alternatives to the current framework, which emphasizes monopolies and high drug prices. In this regard, the, un the current discussions at the World Health Organization about a possible biomedical R&D treaty are quite important. In its most ambitious version, the biomedical R&D treaty would provide for a new and much more enlightened approach to addressing the global need to provide sustainable financing of R&D, and this is an area where uh, Professor Kriya plays a very important role because he's on a commission that's wrestling with this issue and they expected to issue a report on this issue sometime in the uh, uh, early part of 2012. Uh, 
another area which I think is quite important, also under consideration by the WHO, is the, the proposal that you could eliminate the monopoly on drugs completely and separate the market, and delink the market between um, funding R&D and drug prices and have marginal cost pricing and generic pricing worldwide on products. If you can introduce the idea, most recently really seriously considered in the 19th century of developing alternative reward mechanisms for drug development based on prize funds. Uh, one of the proposals, for example, uh, that's being considered deals with cancer drugs, where cancer drugs, unlike AIDS drugs, do not have the benefit of, of uh, sort of a, an exceptionalism in US foreign trade policy or a global fund, but the inequality of access of cancer drug is very, very stark. A drug like Herceptin, which is a very, very effective drug for HER2 positive breast cancer, is essentially not available in the majority of the world's population that suffers from breast cancer. Um, it's $3,000 per injection in India. Uh, that's a drug you have to take every three weeks for 12 months. It's, and it's just one of several new drugs in this area. More than half the new cancer drugs have come on the market, have come on the market since the year 2000. Um, uh, in, in the cancer drug proposal, the cancer proposal that's before the WHO would be to eliminate monopolies on cancer drugs in developing countries in, in, in return for a certain fraction of the budget devoted to cancer care to be set aside into a reward system for people that develop cancer system. So you negotiate the reward that pays off people that develop cancer drugs, not through high drug prices, uh, but, but through some other mechanism. Now, just to give you an idea of how, how high drug prices are for cancer, for the competitive price of um, AIDS drugs today for HIV in the most commonly used ones that are subject to compulsory <coughs> license and generic supply runs anywhere from $300 to, 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 to $700 per kilo in a delivered form, a formulation. There are cancer drugs that are priced higher than $500 million per kilo of active ingredient. Um, there is just enormous markups uh, in the cancer drug market and this is really quite important. So. I, would, I will conclude, I will say that, uh, that uh, uh, the Doha Declaration was a great achievement. I think it, 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 it has many, many benefits. There's been lots of backtracking. And I think the most important thing to resolve is to really have a sustainable outcome, which I think has to do with how you pay for innovation. And I think that if you don't deal with the issue of how you ultimately pay for innovation, and the contributions by countries from all ends of the spectrum, you will never really fundamentally resolve the access issue because they're interlinked, they're completely tied together in our opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for that contribution. Uh, Stan Slaw, can we please have your presentation? Um, thank you and uh, good afternoon to, to everybody. My name is Stan Slaw, I am the Deputy uh, Permanent Representative to the Mission of Brazil uh, and to the WTO and other international organizations here in Geneva. So uh, let me start by thanking, thanking both uh, KEI and the South Center for this invitation and to participate uh, in this panel, uh, the purpose of which is to assess the state of implementation of the Doha Declaration 10 years after it was adopted. Well, this is a challenging topic. Uh, uh, on the one hand, it is true, as stated in a policy brief that was circulated by the South Center on, on this matter, that the Doha Declaration remains a landmark achievement for clarifying the relationship between IP and public health. Uh, on the order, the, jury's, the jury is probably still out on whether or not the declaration has fulfilled all the expectations placed on it when it was signed 10 years ago. Uh, but rather than trying to make myself an overall assessment of the Doha Declaration during that period, I will try to bring you a national perspective, focusing on how Brazil has made use of it. <coughs> Since I am the only representative of a government in this panel, I thought it would be more useful for you if I can share with you the concrete experience of my country in implementing trip flexibilities on public health grounds. Uh, but before I do that, let me fake, make a few remarks on the current state of play in multilateral IP negotiations. And the Doha Declaration 
together with the development agenda approved in WIPO in 2007, are the only significant multilateral IP instruments negotiated over the past 10 years. And none of them is, however, a legally binding instrument. Uh, and why is that? So let me go back a little bit further. As is widely known, intellectual property was introduced at the WTO as a result of the TRIPS agreement following the completion of the Uruguay Round in the mid-90s. Within the single undertaking of the Uruguay Round, the TRIPS agreement was widely seen as a victory for the developed countries, a victory that at that time represented the culmination of a long process led by a few countries that were under intense pressure from a few of their, their industries, mostly the software, the pharmaceutical, and the entertainment industries. The process that led to TRIPS had an agenda which was relatively simple, which was strengthening intellectual property rights. It involved a mix of different initiatives, conducted both bilaterally and in multilateral fora. Uh, I will not recall the whole process of the trip negotiation here. It is both well known and well documented. But what remains paradoxically odd, however, is that the apparent winners of the trip negotiations do not appear to this day to be satisfied with the outcome. The implementation of the trips has barely been completed, in fact, and yet over the past few years, developed countries have been pushing for more what is so-called TRIPS plus disciplines in several areas. And uh, there seems to be no end, in fact, to this drive for ever more stringent rules to advance the protection of intellectual property. <coughs> Caroline Deer refers in her, in her book uh, called The Implementation Game to the bitter debates over TRIPS between developed countries and developing ones uh, as a history of contestation. And in this, uh, uh, in this history of contestation, <coughs> usually be played on a stage where a war of ideas, of convictions, and of ideologies sometimes takes precedence over both factual assessments and empirical evidence. Uh, that is not to say that after trips, intellectual property has ceased to become a dynamic field of international law today. That is not true. But one has to bear in mind that most of the new standards, and this is a danger, are being negotiated either in bilateral agreements or in plurilateral agreements, such as ACTA. Only a handful of initiatives are being pursued multilaterally. And most of them can be viewed as attempts to bridge gaps identified long time ago. They are not meant to break new ground. And uh, at the WTO, for example, there are three topics under discussion in the Doha round. Namely, one, the extension of geographical indications, products other than wines and spirits. Two, the creation of an international register for geographical indications. And three, the interplay between TRIPS and the Convention of Biological Diversity. All of those three issues under discussion in the Doha round fall within the category of outstanding implementation issues and by definition will not change the legal landscape created by TRIPS dramatically. So what is important to bear in mind against this background of apparent deadlock in intellectual property negotiations at this moment is that one has to deal with existing international instruments for the time being. We must implement them and explore all the possibilities offered by them. That's why initiatives such as this panel are very timely and appropriate. Let me now turn to the concrete case involving the use by Brazil of a compulsory license under Article 31 of TRIPS. Brazil started procedures which eventually led to the compulsory license of the patent of the anti retroviral drug efavirenz in the first half of 2007. As it had been the case on previous occasions, the Brazilian government had chosen to achieve a solution through direct negotiations with the company involved. In that particular case, is Merck, Sharp and Dome, the supplier of efavirenz. The Ministry of Public Health 
had held several meetings in this process, several rounds of talks and negotiations, and all of them failed to lead to an agreement as to what might be, in our view, a reasonable terms or conditions that might meet public interest. If evidence is essential, is an essential medicine in the treatment of HIV AIDS patients and constitutes a basic component of the national program on sexually transmitted diseases and AIDS in Brazil. This program is uh, for treating HIV AIDS in Brazil is renowned uh, worldwide for it, one of its particular features, which is universal and free access to treatment by, to, by, by to all Brazilians, which is granted to all Brazilians. If evidence is one of the most frequently used medicines in the antiretroviral therapy. At the time the compulsory license was issued in Brazil, 38% of patients made use of it. Now, a little bit on the circumstances which led Brazil to, uh, to issue the compulsory license. Due to the growth of the population infected with HIV or AIDS in Brazil, the maintenance of recovering prices uh, by, the, by the producer was threatening the continuation of the program. The prices at that time were around 1.6, I'm saying, stating them roughly, for each pill. And uh, the purchase of efavirins within the program would have cost uh, Brazil at that time around 43 million US dollars per, uh, per year. That is to say 580 US dollars per patient year. We compare the prices with uh, uh, those offered by international organizations and uh, by uh, laboratories pre-qualified by the World Health Organization. And those prices varied from 163 to 166 per patient year, comparing to a 480 that we were paying at the time. So if we really managed to buy a Favidens, or the generic uh, vari uh, variety of it, at those prices, uh, this would imply an annual reduction of around 30 million in the government expenditures in 2007. And until the time when the patents is, uh, are going to expire, which is next year, the patent of this medicine is going to expire next, next year, so the, all the savings of Brazil would, would have reached, with only this medicine, 237 US million dollars. So it's, uh, it's a lot of money. And. Uh, and uh, um, because of that, because of the uh, failure in reaching a, a let's say, a, a negotiated price with the producer of this medicine, uh, a, a, a decree was issued in May the 4th, 2007. It is a very simple decree, but I would like to mention some of its, uh, of its features. First, it was a presidential decree. It was issued by the president. Which, uh, uh, which means that uh, the decision-making process was brought to the highest possible level, which means also that uh, uh, decisions such as these have to be taken really at a very, uh, at the highest, uh, highest political level. That was our, the situation in Brazil at least, that was the way we pursued. The Article 1 of the decree says simply that it's hereby granted ex officio Public interest compulsory license over patents number X, and, and I, there were two patents in fact. Um, the compulsory license referred to in this article is granted on non-exclusive non basis and for public, non-commercial use <laughs> for a period of five years, renewable for until the same period. So it was, it was granted for five, for, for five years. The intention of Brazil was always to produce the medicine locally. It was not only to to, to import. It was to import for a certain period, 